Hey there, listeners. Welcome to the podcast of record continuing quarantine edition live from our individual studios. Mine is at my house. Joe's actually at the office, but not in the podcast studio, just in his office, which if you're watching, you can see is delightfully sparse and bare. Joe, how you doing over there? Just checking I'm Slack. Good. Just yep. being sparse. Just yeah. being sparse. That's good. I'm actually d doing some prep for a segment later on in the show, if I'm being honest with you. But uh, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, yeah. let's start with the segment of the show that's happening right now, and that's our quick fire news. Just stories. trying to be present. It's part of my meditation and regimen for the it quarantine. It should be. Mindfulness yeah. is very important. The calm people would would tell you. Uh, so we're going to start off with a pretty big news story in the digital marketing world, which is Facebook uh, has acquired uh, Giphy or Jiffy. Um, it depends on who you ask. I mean, I guess the company. I think would I'm a say, Giphy person because yeah. Jiffy is a peanut butter. So just from a branding perspective, I understand. The problem with that argument is that the guy that created GIFs says it's pronounced. Giff. I mean, just because you create something doesn't mean you get to name it indefinitely. Yeah, I think he's wrong. Wait, he says it's GIF or GIF? I'm, I'm confused now at this point. He says who GIF, says what? right? He, he, said, says, he says GIF. Yeah. Uh, and it stands for, the first G stands for graphics, which it's a, at that point, it's GIF then. Yeah, yeah. But nonetheless, we digress. So anyways, Facebook acquired them. It is one of the largest GIF, GIF, however you want to say it, um, delivers on the internet. It is plugged into services like Apple's iMessage. It's plugged into TikTok. It's plugged into Twitter. Uh, and those rely on their API. Slack. <laughs> uh, Slack as well. Yep. They rely on their API to let users share and post GIFs. Um, so this is a big deal. Like this isn't just some random acquisition. Uh, they bought a service that is plugged in to a lot of different systems. And I think all of those systems now are probably going to take a second look at whether they, they should continue to have that integration because what access uh, are they giving Facebook now uh, in the long run, especially- You can trust Facebook with this. Yeah. Facebook would never buy a company to get its competitor's data to exploit sure. that data and create a Obviously. competing product. Obviously. That's never happened. Never, virtually ever. ever. They would never do it. iMessage, MailChimp, Slack, Snapchat, TikTok, Trello, Twitter. I mean, they're so just- they're can, integrated can I tell everything. you something crazy that I believe about this? Sure. I believe Facebook when they say that this acquisition wasn't about the data. Wow. And why do you believe that? Uh, because Facebook's primary challenge right now isn't a data challenge. It has uh, God level visibility on what you're doing uh, through the pixel, through the login permissions on uh, when you use Facebook to log in. It's got plenty of that. Facebook's primary challenge is maintaining an edge in the creator space. There's a finite number of creators that people are interested in looking at in any given domain and being able to own the preeminent player in one of those creator spaces is very important to Facebook's business model. At $400 million, I mean, it was nothing. They basically bought it for free terms. So there's basically no downside for doing it. Facebook can buy it, add this new content catalog to their library, which, oh, by the way, uh, one of Giphy's problems is they couldn't ever fully monetize through ads. But do you know who can plug this into their ad platform? So you can just pre-select whatever GIFs or GIFs you want to use in your ads when you run them? Facebook. Mm. Um, so I think that's why they did it. Facebook can directly monetize it. It costs basically nothing. And it's an edge in uh, you know, one of the key creator spaces. There you have it with Joe Clements. Facebook gets the benefit of the doubt for the low, low. Well, price I know he's benefit of the doubt, man. Million. I just think they don't need the data, right? They can see the other apps you're logging into because when you install Facebook on your phone and accept terms and conditions, Facebook's allowed to know about the other stuff on your phone. Uh, if you log in on your browser, there's a pixel dropped on your browser that they're monitoring where you're going. Like they know they don't need. They don't need to know that you logged into Twitter and put a, you know, GIF of a cat on there. What they need is compelling content that keeps their platforms relevant and the edgy, compelling content people were using uh, was happening in GIF format and they had an opportunity to go buy it. Fair enough. Next up on the hot takes, telemedicine has been a big deal during the quarantine. Uh, and there has been a paradigm shift in the world of telemedicine. So this is out of Business Insider. Headline is, there's been a paradigm shift 
Telemedicine lobbying soars nearly 200% in push to capitalize on the coronavirus pandemic and make permanent changes to Washington policy. Um, I have some personal experience here. I had uh, my first telemedicine visit a couple of weeks ago, about midway through uh, the pandemic. Um, I have a newborn at home, so I was not in a place where I wanted to go to the doctor uh, just to get a cream for some eczema on my hands. So I did a telemedicine visit uh, that lasted all of about 30 seconds. I got to pick my appointment time, was the easiest healthcare appointment I've ever had. The doctor called in my prescription to the pharmacy a mere few minutes later, and I got exactly what I needed. Um, so it looks like the lobbying world is taking advantage of this situation to try and push through some regulation changes that they've been working on for a long time. Makes perfect sense. Uh, Joe, what are your thoughts on the telemedicine fights? So, Nipa, before I go, go ahead and share the story. You have some family who are physicians and what you were saying their experience was with telemedicine, because I think it'll illuminate a little bit what my take is. Well, so many of them are practicing telemedicine now, not by choice. And I think that they feel that there's a disconnect from them and their patients, that if they're coming for preventive care, you're not able to catch things if you're not seeing them in person. You're not able to talk to them in a more thorough way. Um, a lot of them are practicing telemedicine from home, which I think would be different too. If this continues, you'd, you'd have an office and stuff, but at home, they have their kids around, they have their dogs around, they're distracted. It's, it's not something that's ideal for them. So, you know, my take on this is, Matt, I think this is the, uh, the bleeding edge of the commodification of the professional class. Uh, you know, the last 20 years, maybe you could even go back to 1970, has been about commodifying, uh, you know, lower skilled uh, jobs. So the cashier eventually just becomes the automated thing. You go up and boop and walk out of the store. Uh, you know, the customer service person becomes, uh, you know, a robotic voice over time. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of things where be technology allows us to disaggregate from the provider, so to speak, and you either go straight to technology or you go to some highly efficient system. And so I think what we're seeing in medicine is twofold. Like one, telemedicine for the patient in a lot of cases is extremely convenient. It's the difference between uh, ordering a cab and ordering an Uber, going into the office versus dialing up on the phone. For the physician, I don't think this is something most physicians are likely to enjoy very much for a couple of reasons. Part of the reason why people go to med school, a lot of them, is they enjoy interacting with patients. They enjoy, uh, you know, talking to a patient, you know, poking, a little prodding, tongue depressor, uh, check the heart rate, things like that. The diagnostic part of it is a fulfilling piece of what they do. Uh, when you take that out of it, they are effectively now a customer service representative <laughs> for any, you know, name any company like the cable Comcast when you call in. That's what's happening is they are being commodified. And there's a couple of the job less enjoyable for most of them. Uh, but it also is going to start to push down their pay. Now, some doctors are very highly paid. Some family practice doctors may not be that highly paid. And so you're going to create this situation where you're pushing down wages overall. What's ultimately going to happen in that space, and I think this is what you'll see with the telemedicine lobbying, is this will consolidate into, um, there's right now a competition in the ways this is going to work. This is either going to work as, hey, there's uh, two or three telemedicine apps that just every doctor uses, and you still have a relationship with your doctor, but you can engage via this app. That's one model. The other model is uh, there's only going to be a handful of companies that provide telemedicine, and you are a customer of one of these handful of companies. Maybe they're owned by your insurer, and like that's it. And so every doctor has to work for one of these five companies. So that's what I think is going on with telemedicine and telemedicine lobbying overall, is you're seeing a battle, uh, how that looks. And you're also going to see the physicians realize that, and I think they have for a long time. That's why in a lot of states, physicians fight telemedicine or telemedicine cross state boundaries. But you're going to see the physicians gear up very quickly, I would think, to start fighting and trying to restrain where telemedicine can go. Because if you let it out, uh, a doctor and an Uber driver become the same thing pretty quickly.
It's just the doctor had to pay a lot more money to become an MD than the Uber driver did to become an Uber driver. You know, and the the driving force, it would seem, behind this is the insurance companies in a lot of cases. Um, you know, when I tried to make a selection on what I was going to to do to to get the visit I described at the top of this session, um, you know, I didn't try to connect with my doctor, my primary health care doctor via telemedicine. Um, I basically saw what Blue Cross would would pay for, and I ended up getting a, a free visit, basically. That was something that they were doing is offering free telemedicine visits, uh, but they had to do that through Teladoc. So it was the third-party service yep. that um, the insurer, in this case, had had partnered with in order to deliver that. So. Um, you know, that is a situation where you're going to have insurance companies driving the decisions there, which I, I think we can probably all agree isn't a great situation. Now, one thing that is interesting is uh, how telemedicine has evolved in the business world. So let's say outside of the typical like doctor patient relationship where you go see a primary care physician or a dermatologist or whomever in your local town, um, we've seen startups pop around or uh, around the concept of telehealth. Um, and I'm thinking of startups like Roman. Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of them seem to be in the men's health space because something uh, that is easy to make a diagnosis for and then send a prescription into a pharmacy for are some men's health issues, right? Erectile dysfunction, uh, hair loss. So those have been the big services that pop up around it because they can give you the appointment on their platform and then they're selling you, um, you know, in some cases they're they're calling a prescription into the pharmacy, but most of these startups are actually just mailing you the the prescription to your front door, right? The the hair loss pill, the hair loss cream, the erectile dysfunction pill, their their packaged version of generic Viagra or whatever it is. Uh, so that's how they're making their money is by giving you a free or discounted telehealth visit in order to get you into their subscription model for their product. Yeah, and you know it's interesting that model, Matt. Like it, so the the thesis underlying those businesses is that to the degree you can reduce the friction between the patient's potential need and the physician's ability to prescribe uh, is the gain you have the potential to make in the marketplace. And right? I also so think specifically in those cases, it's it's reducing the friction because it's topics that um, you know, men are not necessarily super willing sure. or anxious to go in and talk about in person in the office. With their doctor, yeah. Right. Or, you know, a doctor they know. Um, you know. But if it works there, it'll work in other places. So another place we see it a lot uh, is the prescription of, say, antidepressant medications is a big mm -hmm. one now that uh, you're seeing. And it'll eventually pop up, you know, everywhere. Um, I think seasonal they, allergies is another place yeah. you'll see a lot of concentration. There's a service I'm sure that'll pop up that is just going to mail you uh, an allergy test to your house. You'll see a doctor, they'll prescribe, you know, a prescription asthma inhaler yeah. or allergy medication. And, you know, it's interesting we talk about this because uh, this is one of those situations where the pandemic is probably acting as an accelerator on these 100%. items and yeah. it's probably moving it forward by 10 years. This overturning in the medical marketplace was already in progress. It's been in progress for probably more than a decade, but this probably has sped up and it's sped it up on the consumer acceptance side. Same way work from home, very similar, right? Like this was probably going to remote work was going to be a thing anyway. It was how quickly would it happen? Uh, the pandemic ends up as a forcing function that gets people to accept it. Some people like it. Some people think it's suboptimal, but they're willing to do it. Uh, and so you get to break an existing market pattern with this, you know, macro scale impact. Mm -hmm. But this is, you know, something to watch. You mentioned businesses, and this is one of the other stories uh, we have in here, but Amazon providing telehealth for its workers. And so there's another area where you could have the employer reduces its insurance cost by just hiring five doctors to just do telehealth yeah. all day long for its employees. Yep. Um, so the way this this whole industry is going to shake out, no one knows yet, but it's changing incredibly fast. And my guess is it's not changing in a good way for your average physician. There's going to sure. be some physicians who own or have ownership in some of the pieces of this infrastructure, which is going to be important. But I think most physicians end up catching the downside of this. I mean, don't you think it'll affect quality of care too, though? I mean, primary care physicians in general, it is important for them to physically see you in some capacity. If they don't see you all the time, that's one thing, but like they, they do have to see you. They have to gauge your, just the way that you even 
walk, move, like the way that, I don't know. Do, don't you think yeah. it'll affect quality of care? For sure. I think that's why the first place you see it are the things that people just would have put off doing. Right. Like it wouldn't have been so bad. They wouldn't have gone to the doctor, but eh, it's super easy. I push this button on my phone and like it happens. So why not? I think that's the first place you see it. I think what will happen is the technology will get better and better and then it will be full body and then there'll be sensors that are sent in a box to your doorstep and you put on the sensors and the doctor does a recording. And so I think it'll, it'll progress from there from the stuff that you probably wouldn't have done, but you remove the friction, now you do it. That'll provide the revenue and the momentum to make the investments and the other things. So I think you're right. Like, is the quality of the care still the same? No, I suspect like very wealthy people will still have concierge doctors that come to their house. (laughs) So moving on, uh, let's talk about a story directly out of Facebook. So Facebook's been uh, doing some research on how U.S. small businesses Uh, are faring during the pandemic. Um, Small businesses drive a huge amount of revenue for Facebook. Facebook's made it extraordinarily easy uh, to make a quick and simple ad buy and to make a lot of money from small businesses that make, you know, one to $500 in ad buys to promote their small business every month. So they did a uh, a small business roundtable, which was a survey of 86,000 business owners, uh, managers, and workers and companies across the U.S. Um, all these companies had fewer than 500 employees, which is how they are defining uh, small business in this case. So they released- That's the, how the SBA defines small yep. business as well. Co- yep. Common standard for small businesses under 500 employees. So they released the State of Small Business Report, um, which you can find on the on the Facebook website. But the, the key points and the takeaways from the executive summary are this. One, that small businesses are closing their doors, facing an uncertain future. I think everyone understands that and knows it. 31% of owners and managers reported that their small business is not currently operating. Uh, among personal businesses, that number goes up to 52%, uh, of which the majority, 55%, were led by women. Secondly, uh, small businesses' biggest challenges are access to capital and access to customer and the changes in customer behavior. Uh, 28% of businesses said that the challenge they would face over the next few months was cash flow. Um, Also not surprising, we've talked basically every episode for the past month about the importance of cash flow for small businesses. It's why the Paycheck Protection Program was initiated, um, probably still is going to leave a lot of businesses behind that weren't able to access capital. One of the things in this is a lot of business owners say that they are unwilling to take the loan because they don't want to guarantee it in case they can't stay in business. Yep. And that makes sense. Um, Go ahead. Good. No, go ahead. I was gonna say one of the things that stood out to me on this uh, was a do you expect that this business will reopen in the future? Uh, And only about 70%, about 68% said they expected their companies would reopen. Um, You know, roughly a third said they might reopen and then about 10% said they wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Optimistically, what you can expect there is 20% of small businesses are going to be gone by the end of the year. And an important thing that we know uh, is that most Americans are employed by a small business. Yeah. Well, you know, the other thing for Facebook, what's interesting here, Matt, we talked about this a lot, is there's a perception that Facebook's primary advertiser is this giant... The Tide or the Coca-Cola of the world. Good company. Yeah. Uh, Facebook's Facebook's margins come from, you know, small... It's the pizza shop that spends $50 a week to promote its special. You know, it's the push... It's the click to boost post button, which is the difference from Facebook between being like an okay... Uh, you know, tech company to being the hegemon it's become is their ability to make ad buying accessible to anyone of any size sure. and make it valuable to those companies. Uh, I mean, another thing that this report points out uh, is that small business owners are struggling to balance running a business and caring for their household. Nearly half uh, feel burned out trying to make sure their business survives, but also trying to make sure that everyone stays healthy and happy at home. Um, 62% of respondents report spending between one and four hours a day on household or domestic care activities, uh, and particularly women, more women owner managers are affected by this, reporting that household responsibilities were affecting their ability to focus on work, um, particularly compared to, to men. Um, the employee challenges, though, I, I think are going to be very real, too, especially through the end of July, where the combination of state and federal unemployment um, has actually made it more profitable for a lot of employees to stay on unemployment, at least through the end of July, uh, because they can make more money doing that than they can uh, at their, their old job or at their previous job. Yeah. 
Um, you know, th this report is on uh, Facebook's website and Sheryl Sandberg actually wrote the cover letter on it. Uh, there's probably a whole episode we could do on this, but the thing I pull from this, Matt, is the, um, you know, we, we've been through a couple of hurricanes here. And the one thing like, you know, about a hurricane is you can be in your house when the hurricane happens and it sounds pretty bad and it seems pretty bad, but it's not until the next morning that you become aware of the extent of the damage, like how many trees are down, yeah. what's your neighborhood look like, how many roads are blocked, who has power, who doesn't have power. And I think we are still, we still haven't seen like that first morning where it's clear and everybody goes outside to assess the damage to the economy. I don't think that's actually happened yet. And what I see here is one in five small businesses are probably toast uh, before the year is out. And that's a far larger problem uh, than I think has been recognized so far because so much of our attention has been focused on, you know, Amazon, Costco, Walmart, Target, Lowe's, Home Depot. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a pretty fair assessment. So while we're on the topic of those small businesses, um, restaurants obviously have been a huge part of that. In some states, including Florida, restaurants have been allowed to reopen to a certain extent uh, for in, in-house dining. Um, I think in Florida, they're up to 50% now that they can have capacity of dining. Uh, I don't know that there are many restaurants that are even seeing 50%. I think overall, the public is still reluctant to go out and, and dine the way they were uh, a few months ago. But what we've seen, obviously, for a lot of restaurants is an uptick in their willingness to be on delivery or pickup platforms. Um, but the problem for a lot of restaurants, which are a notoriously low margin business, uh, is that those platforms all take significant portions of the revenue generated by those orders and keep it. Um, and so what we're seeing now is some cities are looking to cap delivery fees. And this is a story out of Politico, particularly the Politico New York branch, um, that we're looking to place more regulations on those delivery services to prevent. Yeah, I think taking, LA did cap it last week at 15%. Yep, to prevent them take 30% of the, the order cost. I mean, let's like, I mean, you got to spell out the, kind of the disaster that is this situation a little bit. Um, so, you know, you said this on the one hand, you have restaurants that are low margin businesses to begin with. Well, you got to choose the between the slow bleed and the just like full yeah. on gunshot wound. And on the other hand, you have the delivery companies, which although they've raised billions of venture dollars and have cash on hand, they basically lose money with every order they deliver. So they are money losing enterprises. And then you have this scenario where both of these businesses uh, are in this strange relationship where they are both reliant on each other to survive, but you know, both potentially bleeding each other out at the same time. And so you have this weird business ecosystem where it's hard to tell if the relationship is parasitic or symbiotic. I suspect what would happen if you give this enough time to work out um, and assuming the delivery companies are sensitive enough to the businesses they're delivering for, that you will find like a market equilibrium there on a model that works, given that this is a service that consumers are demanding at this point more than ever, and that it's not clear to me that a restaurant buy on its own. I, I don't know of too many uh, restaurants that are using an out-of-the-box delivery software where they're making their own you know, deliveries and taking their own orders online. Certainly pickup that exists, but not in the delivery space. There are some. I mean, there are some. Uh, I, I don't know how popular they are, but there's some tech options out there um, that basically give you the platform. And instead of charging you a percentage of your orders, they just charge you a flat monthly fee to have access to the platform. And then you're responsible for all fulfillment, right? You're responsible for hiring drivers, sending them out. Okay. Um, I don't know that it's particularly popular because one of the advantages of a service is not having to have drivers on staff and deal with insurance liability and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, one of the places where I think these companies are hugely vulnerable from a social perspective on this issue um, is I think that it is going to be a surprise still to a lot of um, diners here in the United States um, that these companies are taking so much as a percentage from the restaurants because they you are not the only, delivery fee you're paying delivery fees and in most cases you're paying multiple delivery fees right you're paying on bite squad you're paying a, a delivery fee then you're paying a fee 
um, that you know they say is so that they can keep their drivers employed on a full time basis instead of as contract employees. Then also, Bite Squad's taking their piece from the restaurant. So I think that is a vulnerability for these delivery systems um, is that they're going to hit hit hard by taking a big chunk of the restaurant's revenue and taking their pieces from the consumer. Uh, most of those platforms give you an opt out by you know give us a hundred dollars a year and you don't have to pay these delivery fees anymore. Um, so that is, I think, where their weakness is going to be is as more people figure out what they're up to, um, there's probably going to be some social pressure. And if and if that campaign, you know, arose, I think it would be pretty simple to just go and have restaurants in New York City or in a state calculate how much of their revenue over the past two months they've given to delivery platforms and then force the delivery platforms to be in a position where they have to defend why they took so much revenue given the service that they provide. Yeah, but you know, then they'll just say, "Well, we lose money still on every delivery." But I, I think that's a really weak point to have to argue with because I think most Americans are gonna be like, "Well, you're charging fees in three different places. Yeah. I understand how you're losing money. That seems like a personal yeah. problem." Yeah, I mean, look, I think what's gonna happen in that space is you're gonna see some consolidation, some M and A happen. Um, so you'll you'll see some consolidation, which will allow prices to rise uh, a little bit more. And then what you'll see is a clear fee structure, where maybe you just understand that when you when you push order on you know Grubhub or Uber Eats, like it it's twenty dollars extra. There's just going to be a twenty dollar you know yeah. markup on there. Um, now that poses business model challenge for you know small dollar orders. Uh, for sure. But I think what you'll end up with is just a more transparent fee structure. I mean, in small dollar orders, except for like the biggest cities where they're in walking distance sometimes, um, basically just don't exist on these platforms anymore, right? Like you can order a smoothie or a sandwich and it's still going to cost you upwards of $20 yeah. by the time all those fees have kicked in. And then at the end of the day, the restaurant just made, you know, $3 to, to make so, you a sandwich. So, I mean, give me your case. Is this, is the current delivery restaurant system we have delivery on demand, is this actually a sustainable business? Or is this going to be looked at as like one of those crazy things like the kids tried in the boom days of the 20 teens? I think what's going to happen is probably what has happened in a lot of other tech spaces is you're going to end up seeing an open source uh, system come out that's going to take hold with a lot of restaurants. It's going to take some of those restaurants getting past the position they're in now. Um, and it's going to require them to to kind of organize to where they have, you know, essentially, and it's, it's only going to work in big cities at first, where they have, you know, kind of like a, a messenger service where you have messengers flying all over town on bicycles delivering people's inter-office memos or legal documents or whatever um, that doesn't hurt the restaurant as badly, right? Where there's a very transparent upfront fee that delivery by a driver makes 10 bucks to deliver your order. And there's no platform behind it all that is taking a huge piece of the profits, that it's an open source, like contributor-based platform, um, you know, much like you know, a name. TaskRabbit. Sure. But like a you know, but you essentially have people organizing together to to write the code instead of a you know venture yeah. backed firm behind it. Interesting. Um. So last story, uh, and this is one I pulled. And I know uh, you are. Uh, That's part. There's yet, literally there's an Uber Eats driver pulling out, up to my house right now. <laughs> um. It's a great timing, great product. I, I assume to bring, yeah, I assume to bring so something to my. There's wife. a show net or um, Amazon Prime just released called Upload, and it's you know it's kind of this pseudo dystopian future in a world where when you die, uh, you can upload your brain into the cloud and live in this really nice virtual resort. Uh, the only catch is they basically have to vaporize your head uh, in the process of uploading your brain to the cloud. So uh, it's it's well done. It's kind of Silicon Valley meets The Good Place meets maybe Black Mirror, uh, all three of those combined. Um, what I think is interesting is it has some funny takes on uh, corporate mergers, uh, strangely enough. And so, you know, the main company that owns the software that uploads your brain is called Oscar Mayer Intel. Uh, and then there's another company in the show called Nokia Taco Bell. Uh, which I think go together because they sound interesting when you say them. That's probably why the writers wrote it in and then they don't 
they offer different things. But what I wanted to do with our last few minutes here, Matt, is I think we're going to go into a period of very significant uh, mergers and acquisition and market consolidation. And some companies are going to try uh, various types of horizontal and vertical integration. And so I wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, what some of the big mergers might be for some companies. And so, uh, you know, I'll just throw, you know, one out to you. Uh, you know, let's say Robinhood, the, the investing app, which has gotten a lot of investor money in recent years, like where would you see a company like Robinhood going? So it's got a lot of information on millennials and their spending habits and their investment habits, but it might go through a tough period uh, in the near future. And I don't know that it will be, but my guess is this might be something someone looks at to buy. Who do you think would be a good buyer? Or a funny buyer. I'll give you that one too. Yeah, I mean, I would almost take the reverse of it and say, what is Robinhood going to buy, right? And if I were Robinhood, what I would probably do is take my crowdsource investing platform and use it to either purchase or create the next social network so that instead of a venture-backed firm owning the social network, you all of a sudden have completed your mission of getting like investing power to the people. And now I own pre-publicly available shares of the next tech startup that's going to come out. Um, on who would buy them that is interesting. I, I mean, I, it, it's kind of easy to say like the typical, you know, JP Morgan Chase, uh, Charles Schwab, people out there would be interested in buying it. But, um, you know, I, I could also see the reverse happen where TikTok decides to buy it, right? Um, and now TikTok has an investing platform built in and has, you know, millions or billions of more points of data on the millennial audience that it's trying yeah. to, to expand into because it's, its audience is primarily driven 25 and under right now. A great way for them to jump into people that have a little bit more disposable income, but are still likely long term to become TikTok users. Uh, that's an interesting one. All right. Uh, DJI, the drone company, valued at $8 billion. Uh, where could you see a company like DJI going? Uh, who might buy it? And or who do you think they would buy? By the way, Matt, Matt's giving these to me off the top of his head. We have not rehearsed these. We prior. haven't rehearsed these. Um, so here's a, an out-of-the-box one. I think Publix should buy DJI. And I think the grocery should, chain. Yep. And I think it should go around or, you know, pick whatever your regional large grocery chain is. So it could be Kroger or, or wherever you are. Um, but I think they should buy the drone company and go it around having to depend on Amazon or anyone else to make their package deliveries via drone. And I think Publix should have its own fleet of drones delivering goods to my door every time I need a jug of milk or a scoop of butter. Um. So like taking on Amazon and that like drone delivery space. Well, just not needing to depend on Amazon. I don't know that yeah. you're necessarily taking them on, but not ever needing to sign a deal with another delivery partner in order to get groceries to your door. Right, right. now, I mean, Publix doesn't have uh, its own delivery service. It partners yeah, with Instacart, Instacart and Shipt uh, in order to get groceries to your front door. If you've got a fleet of drones and you're cleared for airspace usage, my Publix is a mile and a half away that I shop at. It would be really quick and easy to get that drone delivery. I'm mostly not ordering super heavy stuff. Um, all right. So last one, and this is the most challenging given the current environment. Uh, <laughs> we work. And man, did the former WeWork CEO really win big on this when they pushed him out and paid him for his stock? I think they paid him like $5 billion just to leave right before yeah. the pandemic. Uh, we were. Yeah, I just want to be gonna clear. I'm going to assume they're not buying anybody. What? I just want to be clear. Like I would, I would leave. Yeah, for $5 billion. me too. Uh, yeah. We work. So commercial uh, office space around the country. Uh, who buys we work? What was the the last part you broke up there? Uh, who buys we work, and what do they do with it? Mm. I got nothing. You got one you want to go with? Yeah, so I'll give you a crazy one. Okay. Uh, if I were, say, um, Facebook or maybe the company Magic Leap that makes the uh, AR technology, mm -hmm. uh, I would buy WeWork and I would turn it into a very socially spaced VR arcade and VR experience station where you come in, you pay by the hour, by the half day, 
Uh, and then you have a, your own cube where you are doing uh, whatever you want to do in VR during that time period. So, you know, gaming or, you know, working or anything like that. And so where we work was trying to specialize in these in-person collaborative spaces. Uh, one of those companies that owns the technology to make these virtual meetings happen, uh, you go into your own private space, you strap on the headset, you know, the mic, and then you're in a big, you know, virtual meeting with you and like 27 of your friends and you're doing, you know, whatever you want to do, business meetings, gaming, shopping, all of that stuff. Uh, and I think that helps accelerate the acceptance of uh, VR in the home. I think one of the challenges to a real immersive VR experience is you have to dedicate space to it. You have to have the right chair and the right computer and the headset and the whole nine yards. Uh, and this lets people get an experience when they need it and when it makes sense to be in a VR, AR first environment. Mine is Apple. I think Apple should buy WeWork. Uh, and I think it turned Apple, into Apple stores, Apple mega store. Almost. I think it should turn it into a chain of small genius bars so that social distancing implementing measures can be taken and you can go in and have a more private Apple genius bar appointment that is going to cost you a little bit more money, but they can also upsell you on a personal level on everything they need to upsell you on. Ah, uh, interesting. So it's like a uppity like tech support. Yes. And now you got all but these in people. Your neighborhood already. Yeah. And you'd have plenty of space because yep. these offices or spaces are typically pretty large. Well, if you're going to make the upsell, you want to have your products out on display still. Like, oh, you don't have an iPad? Well, this is the 12.9 inch iPad Pro. All right. If, if NEPA will permit, I do have one more I want to run by you. All right. Go. I know we're out of time. Uh, Last one. Sp SpaceX. What should SpaceX buy? What should SpaceX buy? Tesla, no. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've never heard that before. <laughs> what should SpaceX buy? Garmin. What would they do with it? Completely consolidate and take over the GPS market. Interesting. Um, so they own the private GPS space. So what I was going to say is uh, Pinterest or another type of real estate site. And because they're putting all these Starlink satellites and mini satellites up in space, uh, I'll allow you to rent satellite time for flyover and picture taking on, you know, whether it's, you know, your house you need to get a picture of or your scouting a space or you're a company that needs to, you know, observe how an event is unfolding. Uh, so, you know, satellite views, you know, think like Google Earth, but near real time. And I know scale. this is already available, but it's not available at scale. I think they should buy Panasonic. The camera company? Well, the electronics company. Oh. To make those satellites? Nope. Components? I think they should buy Panasonic because I think one thing that is going to be wildly popular in a very specific niche market going forward um, is now that we can easily and cheaply get satellites into space, uh, sat phones being $12 a minute are going to be a thing of the past. Um, and Panasonic is famous for making a lot of the devices that are used in those kind of situations. You have the Panasonic Tough Book that is widely used in law enforcement and military. Um, they have phone, they have other devices that are widely used in tough oh, situations. Yeah. And I think that SpaceX, because they can easily and cheaply get new satellites up in a matter of hours, uh, should buy Panasonic and basically make a satellite technology that is available to the world. There's no reason I shouldn't be, if I'm going on a hike in the woods, there's no reason that as a consumer that has at least a bit of discretionary income shouldn't be able to afford a satellite phone. Yeah. And that's kind of the concept with Starlink is internet everywhere. Yeah. Um, all right. I think we are out of time. All right. No, no Oscar Mayer intels in this. So that's kind of disappointing. I mean, we can always, we can always come yeah. up with one for next week. Uh, as always, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Chick-fil-A Pornhub. Chick-fil-A, that is not a good combination. It's a great cultural gonna, fit. We're probably going to get some kind of cease and desist letter now. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, if you enjoyed this episode or any of the episodes, jump in your favorite podcast app of choice. Give us a rating and review. Helps more people find the show. And we do know that there's more of you out there because we look at the stats and there's more people listening over the last few months. So we appreciate you. have you. nothing else to do. We have a captive yeah. audience. We have a captive audience. So we appreciate you. We're glad you're listening. Uh, if you've got a suggestion for a show, uh, if you've got an idea, um, probably not a guest. We get a lot of guest pitches and we don't really have a lot of guests on the show anymore. So let's let's kind of tone down the guest pitches. But if you've got an idea that you'd like to hear us deep dive or talk about. I will uh, return it down. I don't see these guest pitches. Oh, that's because they come in as spammy LinkedIn messages. So you obviously need to get on your LinkedIn game. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can do so at podcasterrecord.com. So we will see you next week. Thanks for tuning in and goodbye. <laughs>